A ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants in Gaza appears to be holding despite rocket strikes from both sides within minutes of the truce coming into effect. The UN warns of a real risk of nuclear disaster as fighting continues around Europe's largest nuclear power plant. And a win for the US Democrats as the Senate passes a massive 360 billion euro package aimed at reducing inflation and cutting carbon emissions. The Israeli military struck at Islamic Jihad targets minutes before and after a ceasefire came into force Sunday night in response to earlier rocket fire from Gaza. Since then, the truce appears to be holding. The Egyptian brokered deal was welcomed by residents of Jabali refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. It follows nearly three days of violence that has killed dozens of Palestinians and disrupted the lives of thousands of Israelis. We hope that we won't have wars. We are a people and we have the right to live our lives in Gaza. We do not want wars every year or every two days. And now we have not recovered from the previous war. Israel is taking nothing for granted. And its defense minister has instructed the country's forces to be on standby to react to any breach in the truce. Israel and Gaza militants have traded rocket and airstrikes on numerous occasions. But this time, Gaza's ruling Hamas group is sitting on the sidelines. Israel says it launched its operation with a strike on Friday against Islamic Jihad because of intelligence of imminent attacks against Israeli civilians. The remains of a Ukrainian armored vehicle near the city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region. There's been intense Russian shelling here, but the war appears to be entering a new phase with Russia readying for a Ukrainian counteroffensive between Zaporizhzhia and Russian occupied Kherson. That area includes Europe's biggest nuclear power station, which came under fire late Saturday. Each side is accusing the other of the attack, with the UN nuclear watchdog calling for an immediate end to all military action near the plant. In the capital, Kyiv, US actress Jessica Chastain became the latest Hollywood star to visit, following in the steps of A-listers Ben Stiller, Sean Penn and Angelina Jolie. Chastain's main objective was to visit a cancer ward in a children's hospital. President Vladimir Zelensky continues to welcome celebrity guests, saying their presence exposes the plight of the Ukrainian people. Meanwhile, eight vessels have now left Ukrainian Black Sea ports carrying grain and other agricultural cargoes. It's part of the deal brokered by Turkey and the UN last month to unblock the country's exports after Russia's invasion. It's a rare diplomatic breakthrough in this five-month-old conflict. On this vote, the yeas are 50, the nays are 50. The Senate being equally divided, the Vice President votes in the affirmative, and the bill, as amended, is passed. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris casts her tie-breaking vote after an all-night session in the Senate to pass the massive $430 billion Inflation Reduction Act in a stunning turnaround for President Biden in his agenda. The ambitious package aims to tackle climate change, lower the costs of medication for the elderly and reduce energy prices while forcing the wealthy to pay more taxes. Today, after more than a year of hard work, the Senate is making history. I am confident the Inflation Reduction Act will endure as one of the defining legislative feats of the 21st century. Our bill reduces inflation, lowers costs, creates millions of good-paying jobs, and is the boldest climate package in U.S. history. Democrats say the legislation will cut U.S. carbon emissions by 40 percent by 2030 as the climate crisis comes to the forefront of the political agenda in the U.S. It calls for billions of dollars to encourage the production of more electric vehicles and foster clean energy. Despite 18 months of intense wrangling, the bill will now be sent to the Democratic-controlled House, where it could pass as soon as this week.
U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is in Johannesburg at the start of a three-nation tour of Africa. His visit is seen as part of a competition between Russia and Western powers for support from African countries over the war in Ukraine. On Sunday, Blinken visited the Hector Peterson Memorial, which commemorates a student killed in 1976 when protesting South Africa's regime of apartheid, which ended in 1994. Last month, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov visited four African countries as he tried to gain support for President Putin's war. South Africa is one of many African countries that have maintained a neutral stance on Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and have not publicly criticized Russia. Blinken will later visit Congo and Rwanda this week. Taiwan's Premier Su Seng Chang says China has arrogantly used military actions to disrupt regional peace and stability. Chinese military exercises around the island are set to wrap up on Sunday. But Beijing has announced fresh drills in the Yellow Sea, located between China and the Korean Peninsula, to take place next week. Furthermore, Chinese diplomats continue their campaign to lay the blame on the U.S. for causing chaos in the region. On Saturday, China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Hua Chunying, accused the U.S. of interfering in Beijing's internal affairs. She added that Washington should have stopped Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last week. The United States, on the other hand, has accused Beijing of being provocative and irresponsible. Almost half the global container fleet, nearly 90 percent of the world's largest ships, passed through the Taiwan Strait this year. Uh, since their missile launches, Beijing has taken an irresponsible step of a different kind. They've shut down eight different areas where our two countries have been able to work together. Meanwhile, Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Li met on Friday with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, with Russia backing China's One China principle. Colombia has sworn in its first leftist president. Gustavo Petro, who is a former guerrilla, won the presidential election in June, promising voters frustrated by poverty that he will fight inequality. His appointment heralds a turning point in the history of a country haunted by a long war between the government and guerrilla groups. On his trademark micro sailboat, French sailor Yann Canet pulls into Saint Brieuc in France's northwest to a hero's welcome after sailing around the world. Three years ago, I did not expect that, he says. Indeed, three years ago, Yann boarded a four meter walnut hull he had built with his own hands. I learned to sail on my own, so at the beginning I did small circles around Saint Brieuc. I went to the Azores, then I crossed the Atlantic, and now I've done a loop like that. It took a long time to learn how to sail around the world. Reflecting on the three-year voyage, Yann remembers the delight of arriving in French Polynesia and the difficulties crossing the Indian Ocean. He's only been home for one day, but he's already planning the next trip. I'm going to build a new sailboat, a small one, very small. I don't like big boats because they're for big, serious people, and I'm not a big, serious person. So I'm going to build another small boat, and I'm going to try to spend a winter in the Canadian far north. I don't really know the destination yet, but it's a bit of a goal to do a wintering in the far north. But before he leaves again, he's got people to see and a book to write set to be published in November. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. 